Greetings folks. Today we're going to talk about the insulated gate bipolar transistor or IGBT for short, insulated gate bipolar transistor. This combines in some respects a power bipolar transistor with an E-MOSFET. Kind of an interesting combo. Matter of fact, before we go any further, I'll show you what the typical schematic symbol looks like. And you can see that the symbol itself even sort of combines a transistor, a normal bipolar transistor, and the gate part of an eMOSFET. It has three terminals. This is called the emitter and the collector, as we would expect, and the gate. So we have a collector, emitter, and a gate. Now, as far as usage, the IGBT is a power device. It's a big power device. Um, it's essentially, it has replaced uh, some older devices like uh, SCRs, primarily because it's uh, an easier to drive device. The drive circuits are more straightforward. Um, on the other hand, it, it is a bit more expensive than a BJT, right? So you got more dollars than a GG. BJT for it. So this is not like a be-all, end-all kind of thing. And it's not quite as fast as uh, a power MOSFET. So, and there's definitely a niche for this. You know, high-speed applications, uh, you know, maybe a, a, like a switching regulator or something like that. You know, MOSFETs are really good general purpose kind of uh, power applications, power bipolars are still really good, but there are those sort of um, very high power applications, um, you know, certain kinds of like uh, device drives, motor drives, uh, induction, uh, cooktop, things like that, that a, um, an IGBT would work really well. So how are these things constructed, right? What's going on inside? Well, I'm gonna do a little cutaway drawing here. So it's a multi-layer device. A couple of N-channel wells up here. And this area in here is referred to as the P-body. Not to be confused with Mr. Peabody. Down here, this is P plus substrate. The plus usually means that uh, the doping level is high, a minus would mean that it's a low doping level, light doping. This terminal is the collector. And in between here, we have uh, end material. Now, this end material this might be split into two pieces. You, there might be a top layer, which is an N minus drift region, and then a bottom layer, put kind of like a dotted line through it, which is an N plus buffer. If that's the case, we have what's, what's known as a, a PT type or a punch through. If it's single, then it's just an NPT or a non-punch through. So what is a punch through? What's the deal here? Well, uh, two advantages. It's higher speed. Punch through is better speed. And lower on state voltage. So it's more efficient. Right, less loss. All right, the other connections that we have up top, here's the emitter connection. And then, we have some insulation over here. And then metallization for the gates. So 
this is just connected across like so. All right, so you got your gate, standard sort of MOS gate affair, um, then the emitter connection off to your collector. Now, basically the way this works is if you put a positive voltage on the gate, just like with a, an EMOS, what's going to wind up happening, oh, you know, I really should draw this further over here. My bad. Okay, a little better. Uh, so if we put, anyway, we put a positive voltage on the gate, what's going to happen is, just like a, a MOSFET that we've studied, you think plus, 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 minus, minus, minus on this side, what, is, what ends up happening is you create an n-type inversion layer. in the P body. And that will allow current flow, right? So you wind up in here, basically, with this n-type inversion layer. So now you have a path for your current, right? sort of this vertical path, if you will. Now, the construction of this can be seen, as I said, with two devices, uh, a bipolar transistor and a MOSFET. Now, I'm actually going to um, sort of draw this upside down, but it'll make sense in just a second because I'm going to make a little comparison. The top section of this is the MOSFET. All right, so an E MOSFET, if it was an N channel, you'd think N material, and then this, this P material in between that sort of breaks it, if you will. Right? And that's where you put the n-type inversion layer to turn it on, right? first quadrant device. And then the bottom section down here, right? this PNP, makes a PNP power transistor. Right? So you got the FET and you got the BJT. So when you stick them together, you get something that kind of looks like this. There's your PNP. And then we have our FET. like this. So here's the gate, here's the emitter, here's the collector. Now if you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, this is the emitter, this is the collector, right? Why do you have them labeled this way? Well, the reason is the collector and emitter as labeled are the effective terminals for the composite, not for this sort of part of it, this PNP part of it. And I'm going to compare this to a Zikli pair, right? An all, uh, all bipolar Zikli pair. So you might remember what that looks like. You know, we would have there's that same power and uh, power PNP, and you would have the NPN coming in like this, right? So input base current pulls current down through the collector, which draws current out of the base, and we get the control over here. Now on the Zikli pair, that's the base of the pair. That's the emitter of the pair. That's the collector of the pair. Right? So even though this is an emitter, the pair, you treat that as the collector, the emitter, and the base. So it's the same thing over here. For the pair, you treat that as the collector, the emitter, and the gate. Beautiful. Okay, so it's not mislabeled. That's really what the model looks like. Now, as far as performance is concerned, uh, perhaps the best thing to look at first would be the transconductance characteristic, right? The current voltage characteristic. So what we have over here is collector current. And on this axis, uh, we have the collector emitter voltage. Now, the bipolar transistor, we know we're just going to get this whoop straight thing up here at, you know, around 0.7. For um, a power MOSFET, we know there's going to be a threshold voltage, and then the thing is going to take up. And that's exactly what we see here. We're going to see something like this. And that start point, instead of calling it VGS threshold, right, gate source, we call it VGE threshold, gate emitter. Now, if we change temperatures, Right, if we say, oh, let's heat things up a little bit, 
curve kind of comes out like this. So this this curve over here might be for um, a pretty standard 25 degrees centigrade. Maybe this red curve is 150 degrees centigrade. Now that's that's really good. You know, uh, power MOSFETs do this too. Um, what this means, a set of things. First of all, it's square law curve. Right, so this varies as the square, right? Number two, this deal with the red curve being lower means that the temperature coefficient of transconductance is negative. That's great because that means less likelihood of thermal runaway. All right, that's a problem with bipolars, is that the uh, temperature coefficient is positive. So as the thing heats up, it wants to conduct more. In this case, it heats up, it wants to conduct less. That's good. It's self-limiting. Okay. Also, final thing, third, if you get far enough out here, this curve approximates a straight line. Okay, so you could say it approximates a, uh, a straight line at higher voltages. Okay, so when you get out here, all right? Oops. Okay, now another set of curves that would be good here would be um, a set of collector curves. And we're going to get the usual set that we've seen with both bipolars and MOSFETs. So here's your VCE. Here's your collector current. There are some subtle differences. What we're going to see first is the curve as we set one value for um, VGE. So I'm going to make this going up like this. This is going to be increasing values of VGE. So we start with one value of of um, uh, gate emitter voltage, right? Crank it up, crank up the power supply on the collector emitter. And we get a curve that kind of goes like this. You know, eventually we'll hit breakdown. And then if we do it for, you know, uh, uh, increasing value of VGE, we'll get something that kind of goes like that. And so on, and so on, and so on, right? So we get that typical kind of family of curves. The um, sort of variation, the, the, the weird little thing here, is that there is a little delay, right? In a bipolar, you know, it would start right here and just immediately, you know, a bipolar would start like this. Boom, come up, and then, you know, flatten out. So instead of just immediately coming up there in a matter of tenths, this might be, a, you know, a volt or two, um, and again, this is because of the, the turn on required for the, uh, for the MOS part of this. The other thing is this knee, right? The knee out here, before where it, before where it really starts to flatten out, is going to be considerably higher than it is for a BJT. You know, for a BJT, this could be a few tenths of a volt where this thing flattens out. For this, it could be, you know, a few volts, you know, five volts, you know, whatever it works out to for that particular FET. But it's going to be a higher thing. Um, but once we get rolling, you know, once we get above that, we have this nice sort of constant current sort of affair. And, you know, we get the, the expected sort of performance. Okay. Last couple of things to consider. Gate capacitance on these can be kind of large. So that's uh, something that's shared with power, uh, power MOSFETs. How large? Well, you know, thousands of picofarads, nanofarads. Okay. What does that mean? Well, you know, it, it 
low frequencies at DC, we would say, you know, the input impedance into this thing, the input resistance into this thing is huge. But when you have capacitance like this, you know, the drive circuit at high frequencies where you're switching, right, you have these higher frequencies, you're still going to need a, a decent amount of current to um, switch this. You know, you can't just assume, oh, you know, a couple of nano amps will do it. That's not going to be sufficient. Right? So the same kind of thing we saw with power MOSFET. The other thing is that uh, the off-state transitions, right? So, so when we're doing switching, because that's likely what we're going to be doing with this, when we're switching this, the off-state transition, in other words, the, the delay time plus the fall time, tends to be slower than the on-state. Now, that might be, you know, like a, a three to one ratio. In other words, it might be, let's say, 30 nanoseconds for on and 100 nanoseconds for off. All right, just, to, just as an example. Okay, so we have, a, we have an asymmetry there, all right? But otherwise, you know, we have this sort of third family of devices, which Ultimately, like I said, you can think of it as sort of a combination of the other two, the MOSFET and the, bi and the bipolar, um, which has a whole nother set of applications we might use. So not as fast as the power MOSFETs. Um, really big power, though, although it is a little bit more expensive than a BJT. So each one of these things is going to have its sort of own favored area of use, right? That's another tool in the kit bag. There you go.